A clean, broken surface on a roadside boulder flashed in late sun. Neither milky like quartz nor greasy like feldspar. Most passers-by never look twice at such ordinary outcrops, but this kind of glint can betray a hidden inclusion. Either a topaz crystal fragment or, less commonly, a diamond-bearing indicator. The opportunity isn't just in what's present, but in what nearly everyone overlooks. Raw topaz and diamonds rarely sit exposed, gleaming on the surface. Instead, they embed in host rocks, granite, rhyolite, or volcanic breccia, where erosion, frost action, and time gradually free small fragments. A glimmer from a broken face, or a transparent speck in gravels can be the only visible sign. The challenge is distinguishing these rare materials from their more common imitators. Topaz often grows in prismatic crystals with vertical striations, showing a vitreous to subadamantine luster. When exposed, it typically resists chemical weathering better than surrounding rock, causing it to protrude slightly or accumulate in nearby wash zones. Diamond, on the other hand, rarely appears as the clear octahedron people expect. Instead, raw diamonds in alluvial or kimberlite-derived settings are often coated, irregular, and dull unless cleaned. To begin, a field prospector should learn to visually reject the usual suspects. Quartz, though abundant and occasionally glassy, lacks the refractive edge and perfect cleavage of topaz. Feldspar may appear blocky, but shows pearly luster on cleavage faces. Glass fragments, especially near roads or erosion sites, can mimic luster but often bubble internally and lack the density of real gemstone material. In regions with known or suspected kimberlite pipes, an overlooked creek bed with dense, rounded gravels can concentrate subtle signals. Here, small black grains, magnetite, ilmenite, or reddish garnets like pyrope may ride in similar density bands as diamond fragments. In granitic terrains, fluorite, mica, and smoky quartz may cluster near pegmatites that also yield topaz. Recognizing these subtle differences begins with walking slower, watching for flashes in matrix rock, and noting any conchoidal fracture with unusual smoothness or weight. Next is building a feel for unexpected heft. Topaz has a specific gravity around 3.5 while most quartz-based stones sit closer to 2.65, a candidate that feels denser than expected for its size, combined with vitreous brilliance and hardness, deserves further tests. Similarly, diamonds, though small, defy expectations with their extreme hardness and greasy luster. So the key isn't just spotting brilliance, it's learning the weight, texture, and resistance that ordinary-looking pebbles rarely deliver. But can the eye and hand alone be trusted? Or will the next test bring clarity? Or complication? A fragment the size of a fingernail lay loose in coarse sand. Glassy, clear, and seemingly flawless. Many would guess quartz and toss it aside. But one telltale cue stood out. Under angled light, the surface wasn't greasy or waxy. It gleamed sharply, almost metallic in reflectivity. That hint of adamantine luster is among the first visual lines separating raw diamonds and topaz from their common lookalikes. At a glance identification begins with this core skill, reading luster. Quartz typically shows a vitreous sheen, glassy smooth but diffused. Glass can mimic this but often displays flow lines, small gas bubbles, or unnaturally rounded fracture edges. Raw topaz presents with high clarity and a more brilliant sharp luster, especially on crystal faces. Diamond, even in rough form, exhibits an adamantine, nearly oily metallic, luster, noticeably more intense than quartz or even topaz. Fracture also matters. Quartz breaks conchoidly with uneven edges, but topaz shows a perfect basal cleavage, flat, plate-like planes that break more predictably. Diamonds cleave along octahedral planes, but often chip irregularly in the field. Observing how a stone breaks, or resists breaking, can narrow down options quickly. Weight in hand is another underrated field test. 
specific gravity provides an internal consistency that the fingers can learn to detect. Quartz, at 2.65, feels light and dry. Topaz, between 3.4 and 3.6, feels subtly but noticeably heavier for its size. Diamonds, at about 3.5, often surprise with their heft when freed from host matrix or sediment. Carrying known comparison samples can accelerate this intuitive skill. Crystal Habit provides the next field clue. Topaz commonly forms as elongated prisms with sharp terminations and striations running lengthwise. In contrast, quartz habits are hexagonal with no striations along the vertical axis. Raw diamonds and kimberlite are often rounded, coated, or pitted from transport and etching, but when fresh, they may display cubic or octahedral hints, especially under a loop. But visual clues only go so far. For instance, color can mislead. Both topaz and quartz can be clear, smoky, or even faintly yellow. Diamond rough ranges from perfectly clear to brown, gray, or even greenish. Purity and brilliance aren't guarantees of value unless matched with other traits. Field lighting matters too. Under diffused daylight, luster differences become easier to spot than in direct glare. Positioning the stone against a dark background often accentuates brilliance and internal clarity. One reason experienced prospectors carry a matte black card or tray. Despite all these nuances, early visual sorting isn't foolproof. Many glass fragments, especially old bottle glass or volcanic glass like obsidian, can appear convincing. Likewise, heat-altered quartz or low-grade barrel might confuse untrained eyes. So the next step is to leave eyesight behind and lean into the land's logic. What does the surrounding terrain tell us? And which zones are more than just rocks and runoff? A clean stream cutting through dry brush carried more than water. It carried the clues of ancient violence. Twisted chunks of basalt, red-stained sands, and weathered granite shards crowded its edges. To the trained eye, this mix wasn't random. It was the geologic residue of an eroded contact zone where volcanic and intrusive histories collided. And in such boundary layers, both topaz and diamond indicators can emerge if you know how to read the terrain. Raw topaz favors a very different birth story than diamond, yet both trace back to extreme conditions. Topaz forms in late-stage magmatic activity, especially within pegmatite veins or cavities of high silica volcanic rocks like rhyolite. These zones are typically linked to granite intrusions that cooled slowly, allowing large crystals to develop. Look for regions where granite contacts older metamorphic rock, or where weathered rhyolite domes reveal vuggy interiors. Pale white or tan host rocks streaked with fluorite, tourmaline, or smoky quartz often mark promising zones. Diamonds, in contrast, ride up from the mantle. Their host is typically kimberlite or lamproite. Rare, volatile-rich volcanic rocks erupted in pipe-like structures. These pipes often intrude cratonic shields. Ancient, stable continental cores found in places like the Kopval in South Africa, the Canadian Shield, or the Sao Francisco Craton in Brazil. Once these pipes weather, they release diamonds and indicator minerals into surrounding drainages. The terrain clue isn't lush or beautiful. It's often a weedy depression or dry, circular low spot where erosion has outpaced surrounding rock. These differences guide prospectors to separate terrain types. For topaz, focus on eroded hillsides with pegmatite float or exposed granite containing myrolytic cavities, small, gas-formed pockets where crystals grew. In arid areas like Minas Gerais or central Utah, these show up as glittering pockets in road cuts or dry washes. For diamonds, seek out paleo channels or downstream zones from known kimberlite fields. Areas where reddish gravels contain black sands, garnets, and serpentinized pebbles can hide tiny but significant signals. In both cases, Landform features amplify the odds. Meander bends, 
Inside curves of streams and natural riffles concentrate heavies. If topaz fragments are present, they tend to settle near feldspar and quartz sands, but will remain unweathered and bright. Diamond indicators, being denser, often show up behind large obstructions or in gravel bars where the flow loses energy. But terrain reading also means recognizing what not to chase. Most riverbeds, despite looking rich, carry little upstream mineral history. A basalt-lined creek in a young volcanic region might glimmer with olivine and magnetite, but not topaz or diamonds. The presence of the wrong lithology wastes time. That's why combining visual clues with mapped geology is critical. In a shallow bend of a dry gully, a fine scatter of dark grains lined the inside curve, nearly invisible unless you knelt close. Among the black specks were flashes of deep red, translucent and rounded. To a casual observer, it might seem like iron-stained sand. But those red grains, under a loop, revealed their secrets. Pie rope garnets, one of the most consistent companions of diamond-bearing kimberlite. And beside them, flecks of black that clung to a magnet. Likely ilmenite or magnetite, spoke of a hidden story beneath the surface. These trace minerals don't just appear randomly. They arrive in clusters, reflecting the breakdown of primary host rocks. Pyrope garnet, ilmenite, and chromite often weather out of kimberlite and lamproite and travel only short distances downstream. If concentrated in one zone, they suggest proximity to the pipe. In contrast, spinel and zircon may occur widely, but also mislead if taken alone. For topaz, the indicator suite is different but equally diagnostic. In granitic and rhyolitic terrains, the breakdown of pegmatite veins can yield small clusters of associated minerals. Green to violet fluorite, flakes of muscovite or biotite mica, and elongated quartz crystals. The presence of tourmaline or apatite needles in the same float zone increases the odds. These minerals resist weathering and remain close to their parent veins, especially in arid erosion zones. The key is context and association. Finding a single red garnet in a stream means little, but finding it with ilmenite, chrome diopside, or enstatite in close proximity signals a potential upstream source worth mapping. For topaz, isolated pieces of fluorite may suggest nothing but when joined by terminated smoky quartz and muscovite-rich float, they begin to suggest a decomposing pegmatite system nearby. Field work now shifts from casual spotting to pattern recognition, sampling gravel bars, inspecting dry fans, and lifting pan loads in slow eddies help isolate where these indicators cluster. Tools are minimal, a strong magnet, a jeweler's loop, and perhaps a small UV torch for fluorite or diamond checks. More sophisticated steps come later. Not all garnets are created equal. Almondine, common in metamorphic terrains, can appear similar to pyrope, but carries a more purplish hue and lacks the chromium trace needed to suggest diamonds. Chromite, often black and granular, can be mistaken for magnetite unless confirmed with simple field observations, like streak color and grain shape. Understanding these subtleties demands both attention and repetition. Mapping these finds on a terrain model, or even a printed topo map, helps narrow potential source zones. A string of garnet ilmenite clusters downstream points toward a higher value target uphill. The field is now speaking in code. But are you reading the right words? To answer that, the first direct material tests must begin. The difference between ordinary glint and actionable find depends on the stone's natural form and context. A translucent shard pulled from pan concentrate caught the sun and threw it back hard. Too sharp to be quartz, too angular to be glass. On closer inspection, its edges were unnaturally crisp and one face bore microstriations, like lines etched by cooling or pressure. It wasn't the shine alone that mattered. It was the way the fragment fractured and sat beside the matrix it came from. 
field intuition had sharpened, but now came the moment of judgment. Is this topaz or just clean quartz? Is this a diamond or cleverly disguised glass? Raw topaz and diamonds each signal their identity differently through structure and context. The first true material test in the field begins not with chemistry, but with a visual analysis of crystal habit, luster, and matrix association. Topaz typically appears in prismatic, often elongated crystals. Look for vertical striations along the prism faces and basal cleavage planes that shimmer even when fractured. These planes often cleave so cleanly that they reflect light like mirror facets. Unlike quartz, which breaks with uneven, conchoidal fracture, smoky or pale yellow topaz may be mistaken for quartz at a glance, but under magnification, topaz reveals superior internal clarity and a more brilliant, less waxy surface. It also resists etching and dulling far better under natural weathering. Diamond identification in the field relies more on form and texture than brilliance. While gem-grade octahedral diamonds are rare, even industrial-grade diamonds tend to show rounded edges, pitting, and sometimes trigons, triangular surface features, on cube or octahedral faces. They often appear coated in iron-stained clays or in matrix rock, especially when freshly liberated from kimberlite. If found in a stream context, look for abrasion patterns. Diamonds will often maintain shape better than quartz or garnet due to their extreme hardness. Luster becomes the differentiator. Topaz shines with a glassy to subadamantine brilliance, clear but hard-edged. Diamonds, even uncut, possess an adamantine luster that stands apart. In dry light, this can look metallic. Underwater, it can be shockingly sharp compared to all surrounding minerals. A rough diamond will not sparkle like a cut gem, but its surface may reflect in high contrast, especially if freshly broken. Matrix tells the rest of the story. Topaz is commonly found within granite or rhyolite cavities. If the host rock is coarse-grained and includes feldspar, muscovite, and beryl, the odds increase. Topaz may weather out and collect in sandy washes or along hard pan edges. Diamond indicators, by contrast, cluster in decomposed kimberlite, which appears as soft, clay-rich, often greenish soil with serpentine, ilmenite, and garnet grains mixed throughout. If you find a stone that tests promising, but it came from river gravel far from any ultramafic matrix, caution is warranted. It may be a simulant. As a control measure, Collect a few samples of common quartz, smoky quartz, and glass from the same site. These act as in-field references when comparing luster, fracture, and weight. More than once, a highly promising shard has turned out to be old bottle glass, tumbled, edge-worn, and perfectly misleading. The final filter before advanced testing is feel, density in hand, friction when rubbed against metal, and resistance when scratched against quartz or ceramic. But if doubts persist, the next low-tech field tool provides clarity with invisible force, magnetism.